Okay. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, I'll leave the introductions for the webinar to Kathleen, but before we start, um, some uh, housekeeping rules. So if you're using social media, please use the accounts and hashtags uh, that are shown on the screen. Um, as a participant, you are uh, standardly muted and you cannot show video. So don't worry about this. This is a setting in the back end, so you cannot change this. If you have a question or a comment, uh, and if it's about the contents of the presentations or uh, if it's like a direct question for one of the presenters, please use the Q&A box. You can access this Q&A box if you hover over the bottom of your screen. At least I assume that's the case with everybody, at least with me, it's on the bottom. So you can just enter your question there, um, and so the presenters will deal with, with it during Q&A time. You can also see the questions that other people ask, and you can upvote them, and you can comment on other people's questions, so that the presenters can see that this is a, the moderator can see that this is an important question. Uh, at the end, during the discussion, uh, feel free to also raise your hand, and we can allow you to, uh, to speak um, if, it's, if the time permits. Uh, if you have any technical issues, if you just want to say hello, uh, please use or refer to share a link, please use a chat box. Um, and we will make the recordings and the slides of this webinar uh, available uh, via the Open Air YouTube and Zenodo. Um, also on the Open Access Week overview page and on the dedicated webinar pages. So probably um, through you found the link to register for this webinar on one of these pages. So just go back there tomorrow and you'll see the recordings and the slides. And of course, we will also announce it on social media. So now, Kathleen, uh, over to you. Thanks, Gwen. Um, hello and happy Open Access Week, everyone. Uh, welcome to the core EIFL Open Air panel on equity and inclusion, community-owned infrastructures for open science. Uh, my name is Kathleen Shearer, and I'm the executive director of CORE, which is the Confederation of Open Access Repositories and I will be moderating the session today. So we have a great lineup of speakers for the session today, and I hope that um, this will stimulate some really good discussion in the community about uh, community ownership and how we can move forward with some good models um, in the coming months and years. Um, and I think this is a very timely session um, as open access and open science expand, um, scholarly communication infrastructures are being integrated um, increasingly into our daily workflows. And we really need to ensure that they're inclusive and are not skewed or designed to support the interests of one group over, over many others. And of course, the groups that often get favored are the elite institutions and researchers that have access to, to most resources. But what does it mean to be community owned? How do we ensure that the right players are at the, at the table in terms of governance? How do we avoid tokenism and empower broad participation and diverse contributions when some organizations can afford to pay and others can't? These are some of the questions we'd like to tease out in today's session. And you know, adopting community-based models can be a really difficult transition for many services and infrastructures because they're often created through um, projects and project funding, or they're based at a single institution, or they're even commercial entities. So what is the best, best path forward for these different types of players? So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dominic Babini. Dominic is based in Argentina and is the Open Access and Open Science Advisor at the Latin American Council of uh, Social Sciences, which is called CLACSO, a network of 736 research institutions in 52 countries. Um, she serves on numerous, numerous advisory boards and has played an important ra uh, role in raising the visibility of Latin American perspective in many international discussions. And uh, many of you are already familiar with Dominic as she has been a real leader in the open access community for many years. So thank you, Dominic, for agreeing to share your perspective with us today. And I, I pass the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to participants today and next days with this recorded session. We thank you also Open Air, CORE, and AFL for your long-standing commitment and support to 
community-led open access and open access and open science uh, initiatives. Today, we wish to share with you in this open access week three of our concerns. The first related to the issue raised by Kathleen about the need for funds for community open infrastructures because uh, scarce resources are going to be directed to APCs in many of our regions. Uh, the other issue is the reward system, which today rewards with the high impact factor. And the third issue is about what we consider is still and uh, an uh, weak interoperability among community-owned infrastructures worldwide. From where do we speak? Well, Claxo as a social science research institutions, uh, we have extended collaboration and co-creation of knowledge with uh, social, social actors which are beyond the scientific community. So the open access venues we have developed in the past two decades are with high representation of bibliodiversity, but this by bibliodiversity needs peer review because peer review today is concentrated in journals. So we need a peer review of other contents as Cora says, next generation repositories. Our editorial catalogs has more than 3,000 open access books, but we need that those books describe the evaluation process of the contents, which does not happen always. And with Redalic, we have a collection of nearly 1,000 uh, social science and humanity journals from Ibero-America. And those journals do not charge APCs because uh, in Latin America, it's a community-led open access. And we have also other formats. Our uh, focus today is on reviewing the evaluation processes in Latin American countries. We think if we don't change the evaluation procedures, open access and open science uh, have less possibilities to grow. In these times, we have old problems. Latin America is the most unequal region of the world. And we have new problems and needs because uh, we, have, we are in lockdown since uh, March in the region. So the economy has collapsed and the socioeconomic situation is dramatic for the next years. So we are learning the lesson in the pandemic that we have to think not to transform the industry from pay to read to pay to publish. We really have to transform this. We really have to continue transforming the scholarly communication so it is community owned and community led. And we have the opportunity with open science we don't want this landscape of hyperinflation of APCs, as yesterday Nature announced, $11,000 for one article in APCs. Uh, we don't want to repeat the story of subscription model. So uh, we have to go forward in other models. We agree with uh, the core board that we need more efficient, inclusive, and governed by the scholarly community solution. No barriers to access, no barriers to publish. If we look at these goals of the global, of the agenda 2030, all these challenges need as much local as international research. And this is about the Open Access Week 2020. We have to look not only what we include in our open access venue, we have to look at who we are ex excluding from our, who is invisible in our open access infrastructures and who is, whose interests are prioritized. 
these are some of the issues we are looking at. And uh, this Open Access, Access Week 2020 remembers us that we have to think from diversity of points of view. We have to look at our communities. And in these pan post pandemic or pandemic times, pandemics which will be repeated, we really need all the voices that can contribute to improve the situation in all our regions. In Latin America, how how does it work, community governance? Well, in pale blue, you see that the journal editorial teams manage journals with no APCs, basically in with OGS and sharing the costs. And the library teams manage the institutional repositories with a very diverse formats and contents. And they manage also the institutional journal portals. Uh, I, today, I read that uh, the University of Sao Paulo has already, in Brazil, has already more than 190 journals published by the university who are in the journal portal. And then you have uh, UNAM in Mexico and the University of Chile. We have many universities with more than 100 journals each. And then you have the National Science Policy Community, which selects the quality journals and harvests the contents of the institutional repositories. So you have the more bibliodiversity in journals and repositories institu at the institutional level, and you have at national level a more selective um, open access venue. So this is at how it works. And at regional level, the community of uh, journals and universities have led the indexing of journals, of peer review journals only. It's Latindex, Cielo, and Redalic. The three are initiative funded by universities or by uh, science funding agencies. And in the fields of repositories, the um, system La Referencia, it's like open air in Europe. Uh, La Referencia harvests the collections of peer review contents from the national uh, repository systems from 10 countries. So in Latin America, it has been decided in, by 23 countries that green and gold are the routes to go ahead, but green have to be inclusive and cooperative, not centralized. It has to be decentralized in the institutional repositories. And in gold, APCs are, are, are inconceivable, it's unaffordable. If you compare salaries of researchers, I think now in Argentina, we need one year to cover one APC of salary of uh, starting researchers, so it's unaffordable. And um, it is recommended that gold open access rules in the region continues its present emphasis on sharing costs and not charging APCs. And what about the community of researchers? They are not so much involved in governing um, infrastructures of open science and open access. We have an opportunity with open science because today they are uh, rewarded with impact factor, but we need to change this. In uh, Claxo, we have developed uh, in the past year a forum of uh, research assessment together with some national research councils of the region. Next uh, Tuesday, 28th, we have an international consultation. If you look in our website, the document, you can comment on the documents and participate in the consultation, please. And uh, now we are expecting the UNESCO recommendations on open science. In the draft, we see some promising ideas to review the assessment practices, to 
reward accordingly to open science practices and um, governed and owned by the community and funded collectively. We consider this is possible in a post-pandemic decade because uh, uh, research involves not only social science, uh, not only scientific community, but also other societal actors in different kinds of production of knowledge, supporting uh, scholarly communications with no APCs and no BPCs. This will help uh, equity among researchers from developed and developing countries. It will support diversification, bibliodiversity, multilingualism, which is so much mentioned now. And it will help co-creation of knowledge. And it will be monitored to ensure that it uh, supports the research community interest and not the industry interests. We have we need researchers to be more engaged with door and laden principles, to use the open access indicators when they evaluate research, to go towards the next generation repositories and use alternative metrics and discuss in, uh, describe in each digital object, which is in the open science process to describe what evaluation has this digital content had. We are a big community, only some of us are here. Uh, we need to reinforce the cooperation and interoperability of all our initiatives. We need to raise our voices to make it stronger, um, to work together, uh, to strengthen community-owned infrastructures. So for our first concern, we think we have to prioritize funding our funds and our other resources dedicated to non-commercial initiatives and to quality certification of the contents because we are paying in Latin America, you pay an additional to the salary if you publish in high impact factor journals. Why can't we pay uh, those researchers for doing pay, peer review of contents in repositories? So we can change the system. Then for the, the weak international interoperability, we have to undertake more international collective actions uh, to move ahead in this very difficult decade, uh, post-pandemic decade we will have. We agree with uh, the statement from INASP that it is not the solution to build islands of excellence. It is not enough. We need voices from different realities to contribute in what we need to rebuild our societies and economy in post-pandemic times. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dominic. That was uh, great. Um, there is one question, Dominic, in the, in the Q&A that I'm gonna read out to you and uh, hopefully you can answer it. Yes. It's Gultikin from Turkey, and he's asking, what do you think about transitioning agreements? And I think he means transformational agreements. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think we are concentrating too much on how to help the industry transform from pay to read to pay to publish. And we should put more, more discussion, more policy, more decisions on how to transform our own scholarly communications, that the scholarly community decides how to transform scholarly communications. Because uh, I tell you, in Latin America, we don't even know how much we're spending on APCs. 
but we are we have already the pressure of the industry making us decide if we are going to make a transformative agreement with our national because the purchase in Latin America is national purchase. You purchase for all the country. And so now there's a pressure. Yesterday we had a meeting with uh, a webinar with the Mexican policies who uh, purchase the national journals for all the country. And we were speaking about uh, meeting of all the consortia whose purchase in Latin America to decide the position of the transformative agreements. It's a crucial moment. I agree with Core and uh, Eloy has mentioned it many times. Uh, it's a crucial moment. We have to support non-commercial open science and open access if we want a sustainable future. That's our opinion in Claxo. Thanks, Dominic. Um, there's, uh, there's also another question now in the Q&A um, from Anve Evangelos. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. You mentioned the necessity of funding to non-APC OA community-based journals. Could you mention which are the opportunities to seek funding at, the, at an international level? At an international level, um, I think we have to start locally. First, for the journal, uh, we have to look at our own scholarly community. If the journal is in a society or if the journal usually is in a university, how do you team work? So you add, you distribute the costs and you have the academics, you have the library, you have the editorial team. In Claxo, we started 20 years ago, team building, the editorial teams with the libraries. Now we have a community of more than a thousand people who work in the library and in the editorial teams of the university's members of Glaxo, and they worked open access together. So they share costs. And then you go to the national level and you ask your research funding agency to take your journal and index it and help your journal to get quality qualifications. And then you go to the regional level and to the international level. In our region, you go to a regional level and Latindex, Redalic and Cielo help you to get into a position of quality regional journals in open access with no APCs. And then you go international in DOA in other platforms. I think it's from down up. And then if you get quality, you can seek international funds to support your initiatives. And many of uh, you see how DOR has received funds and now, and um, it's, um, I think we have to start in your own community, sharing costs. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that, Dominic. I have, I have one question before we move on to, to Tom. Um, you know, you said that we need collective action. And um, so I'm wondering how you think that collective action can take place because there are a lot of organizations, we have a shared vision, but sometimes we struggle to, to unite together to uh, advance uh -huh. things. And so I'm wondering if you have any ideas around how we might be better at that. It's a big challenge. We know that the industry has collective action because they agree. We don't see where, but they do it. Uh, because if not, they could not sustain a profit of more than 30%, which is what one of the most profitable industries of the world, if they would not agree among them. So we have to find open ways to do it. I think an alliance, it has been started. I mean, uh, AFL Open Air and uh, CORE are today with this webinar. We, we, have, we have a mini alliance everywhere. Uh, UNESCO has, a, uh, has uh, done a coalition of uh, 
community-led uh, open access initiatives. We have several seminal initiatives. We have to build a big alliance because the voice has to be very strong and has to be decisive so that the Global Research Council, the International Science Council, UNESCO, the United Nations, the governments realize that this time it is serious and that it cannot be, it is politically incorrect to look at the other way, uh, to make as if it didn't exist. That is my opinion, because you can't believe it, but in Latin America, and I'm sure in Africa it's the same, the impact factor regulates the salaries of researchers at certain levels, so, and the research funds. So open science is impossible in that landscape. Yeah. Yeah, it always comes, it often always comes back to the impact factor and research assessment frameworks need to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I know you're doing a lot of work in that area in Latin America, Dominique. So, so thank you again, Dominique, and, and hopefully we'll have some time at the end to continue on with the discussion. Um, just, uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning that uh, we plan to end, the, the, the webinar was planned for an hour and a half, so we plan to end the webinar in about an hour from now, and again, hopefully we'll have at least 10 minutes or so at the end for some, some more discussion. Um, but on, on that note, I'll turn it over to uh, Tom Olihook, Editor-in-Chief of, uh, editor of Directory of Open Access uh, Journals, or DOAJ as we call it. And DOAJ is a very highly used directory across the world, it's extremely international, and has done some really interesting work around expanding its governance to engage with more stakeholders globally. And uh, Tom will be talking about how this type of governance can impact equity and inclusion. So I turn it over to you, Tom. Yep, thank you for the invitation. And uh, I will start sharing my screen. There is something wrong. Sorry. It looks, uh, we can see the slides now if you put them into presentation yeah. mode. But now I have to do the, let me see, slides. Where is the present? You go up to the top, to the right. Ah, yeah, no, no, I see. It's because the pictures are on top of it. Yes, okay. So I want to talk about the uh, community involvement and the governance structures that are used by Scopus, Rep of Science and the DOIJ. First, I want to show a, a map of the world. It's what we know about the academic journals that reflects the global in inequalities. And this is a map showing what was known about the geography, which is uh, a lot of gaps, a lot of white spots. And um, I think you can compare this to the publishing landscape because what the authors here have said is that there is the known knowns and there is the unknown knowns and the unknown unknowns, which means the known knowns is everything that is knowledge produced in the West or in the North, how you would like to say it. The unknown knowns is that you know that there is a lot of things um, published somewhere else, but it's unknown in the center where the, the, the knowledge is produced in the first place. And then you have the unknown unknowns, which is knowledge that is there, but it's not used, not, not um, worked on, and not published. So it's, it's basically this, the known knowns, the unknown knowns, and the unknown unknowns apply to publishing. 
And the reason for this is that there is indexing services that give, give uh, an indication what is the important knowledge because what they index the journals that is published in a journal that matters and that is knowledge that matters but of course that gives them a very important role in what is published uh, at all so the current publishing landscape is the product of an over reliance on the indexing services because they determine yeah, what is important more or less and the evaluation of the quality in the indexing services most of them is based on ranking you know scopus and the web of science and they value a lot uh, the concept of excellence excellence which is something that you can talk a long time about i won't do that but it's a very vague concept where lots of, lots of things are built on but it's very stupid concept Prom promoting concentration of the power the center and the periphery of knowledge production and you also create exclusiveness because if you have important journals that are listed and scientists publishing there that are important you create an exclusiveness and not an inclusiveness this is mainly fueled by the language and the cultural dominance of the west and the language is english often you even have this in the countries of Europe themselves. More and more, they are dominated by the English language for everything happening there. And very importantly, there is a kind of a false supremacy feeling with white people. I can uh, use the term white, I won't use the term black. But anyway, this is something that matters because it gives everyone who is living in the West and publishing in a journal that is indexed in Scopus, for example, the idea that it must be much better than anything else published anywhere else. There is also the concept of globalization. Globalization makes everything more the same. And this is also in publishing the case. It leads to more dominance because it leads to concentration of publishing in the hands of a few publishing companies and it leads to less diversity in that sense and we want more diversity the scholarly publishing has also become more about the business of publishing and having a lot of money for the shareholders than it is about community and about production of knowledge and advancing the society and helping the community so what has to change? The scholars have to take back control of the scholarly communication as it was in the, the 17th century. I mean, now scholars have given the control of scholarly communication out of their hands, in the hands of publishers. So I agree with Dominique, there should be a community controlled infrastructure. We should make scholarly communication less of a business it should be more of a commodity and there was recently a very nice article published on the commodity that publishing should be promote the transition from the subscription to open access because the longer there is subscription the more emphasis there is on this money aspect and less emphasis on sharing and the indexing services that say what journals are of good quality or even it has deteriorated in the sense that it says what journals are good and meta. These should become more inclusive. They should have more journals from outside Europe and the US. The articles should not be assessed just on citation scores. We should have another assessment system altogether. We should include socioeconomic and cultural factors. We should also include many more journals in other languages than English, because if you are a scholar and you have to publish in English, it will always give some loss in what you want to say, how you want to say it, and even what comes over with the people that read your work. So it's always a disadvantage from the beginning if you have to publish in English. 
So what are these indexing services? I have listed uh, four here, Scopus, Repel Science, KBelt, and the DOJ. Now, all of you know Scopus, Repel Science, perhaps not so well KBelt, only because of the predatory journalist, I assume. And you have the DOJ. And the difference between the four is that the first three are all for-profit companies. DOJ is a non-profit, a not-for-profit company, organization. The Scopus and Web of Science and KBELS all list journals, um, preferably most of the, uh, of the North and of the West. KBELS has not a very big coverage of of journals and it's a company that started to do this not not very long ago so they concentrate a lot on the predatory issue which is not unimportant but uh, it's a special thing altogether here i show you what the content of all these indexing services the journals that are listed is you see that scopus and web of science have a lot of overlap uh, on the right, it means that they list the same journals. The DOJ has a lot of journals that are not listed in Scopus or Web of Science, but also a number of them are not listed, are listed in Scopus or Web of Science and not in the DOJ. And I'm talking about open access journals only in this case. So the conclusion is that there is uh, a lack of completeness of listing of all the journals for all all these indexing services for the DOJ, for Scopus, and for the Web of Science. Although the DOJ has 8,000 journals that are not listed in the others, we have to say there are 2,000 journals not listed in the DOJ. So, what can you say about? the governance and the community involvement and the reason for this overlap. Well, Scopus, I have asked all these entities, Scopus, Web of Science, KBELT, and the DOJ, uh, the major people there, on, on how they see their role in community involvement and in running a business. Scopus has not answered. But we can find some information on the net, and you know there is a lot known about about Scopus. Not in the least that they are part of Relix, which is a shareholder company, and it's really everything they do is for the shareholders. The community involvement is there because there is a content selection and advisory board. They say that it can on in the web that this can lead to more diversity because people are asked to look at what is being selected for the Scopus list. People can also contact Scopus with title suggestions, but that is just more or less a control measure to see that not very bad journals are listed. So in fact, what they say is that there is really not much drive towards more diversity. And I couldn't find any spokesman of, of Elsevier saying, saying something else. I have talked to people from Clarified. I've talked uh, to Nandita Praderi, who is the managing director, uh, director of, uh, of uh, the Web of Science. And of course, it's a for-profit company. And the board members are all from the corporate of finance. So there's no involvement of uh, scholars or uh, even uh, community in a sense, the other, other people that do science uh, outside of the universities. It's all about business. But they do have a community involvement. They consider the quality concerns raised by users. They have a lot of outreach activities for uh, monthly webinars, especially also for other languages. They accept journals in many languages, as long as the titles and abstracts are in English. And they do not favor or prioritize journals from large publishers or the global north, is what she said. And I think it's true. And if you want to be in the Web of Science course selection, you need 
you do not need to fulfill many criteria. There's a set of 24 basic criteria and having an impact factor is not one of them. The most important criteria which you can read in their website is that there's a quality process of producing articles and a good review, peer review system. And of course, the open access uh, criteria. You go to KBELS, it's also a shareholder company. The community involvement is more or less um, restricted to that anyone can recommend the journal for the inclusion in either database. So recommend them for, for being a predatory journal or recommend them for being a good journal. And uh, there are outreach activities. But the representative from KBELS told me that they have a lot of ideas for the future to involve community in building their database, making it more inclusive, which is something that we have to wait for, of course. Then the DOJ is a not-for-profit uh, organization. And since one year or so, we have a council, an advisory board, and an editorial subcommittee that were selected from all kinds of stakeholder communities. Publishers, universities, libraries, people were chosen by these groups themselves who, who wanted to represent their group. The database management that we have, we have volunteer editorial teams all over the world who are uh, native in, have the native language and they will do the assessment of the journals in their region. And we have an ambassador program, an ambassador program which is more directed towards getting the policies in their countries towards open access, getting good publishing practices for the journals there, and also trying to get more journals in open access in their respective countries. I will just quickly flip through this, flip through this, uh, these slides because you can just see them afterwards. It's the structure of the DOJ, just schematically again. The DOJ governance structure, the council, what it does, there's 15 seats with commu community uh, representatives. The advisory board that provides input. It also has a um, different people from different groups and the subcommittee which is a committee that looks into more technical issues on what is admissible in scholarly publishing if there is different uh, if there is very uh, difficult questions arising then they will dispute discuss and see what happens so what I want to go a bit further uh, explaining the DOJ ambassador program. The purpose of the ambassador program from 2016-17 is to increase the coverage of open access journals outside of Europe and North America. So Asia, Middle East, Africa, Latin America. Increase also the quality and the visibility of the journals because listed in the DOJ journals become more visible. We also want to establish contacts with the policymakers of governments, universities, and organizations. And we want them, in some cases, to direct teams, the editorial teams that I talked to you about. We want also to see that there is publishers that want to be listed in the UAJ, because we are not going out and say, just uh, do you want to be listed? It's not our policy. We wait till somebody applies. But in these cases, we have reversed our policy a bit, and we start through the ambassador program to solicit new publications. We want to promote the best publishing practice and raise awareness about the questionable publishing. And this is an overview of where we are and where the journals that are listed in the DOJ are. And what is immediately clear to you, probably, is that we don't have many journals, open access journals listed from uh, Asia, from China, and not so many from Africa either. 
although we have ambassadors there, which is indicated in, in the red numbers. Where, let me just pick one continent, Africa, where we don't have many journals listed in the DOJ, so there is, the open access is just a bit unclear there. The good news is the percentage of open access articles published in Africa is high. That is a study done by Cameron Nalen and his group, and it was just um, told about yesterday in another uh, webinar. The most output of this, however, is published in Western journals. So although there is a lot of open access articles, again, the output is in Western journals because the perceived prestige is such that all the universities want to have their people publish in those journals. And it's most of the time Scopus or Web of Science. This is um, Cameron Nalen's uh, figure showing that there is a lot of open access in different regions of the world. And this is a percentage of gold open access, journal open access, and green open access in diverse countries. And you can see, you can go to the original publication, so the PowerPoint or the PDF, and look at it yourself. It is obvious that Africa or Latin America or other countries are not very bad in how much open access is there. But again, we have to be very careful because it doesn't say where it's published. Most of the time it's in Western journals. So this is just a bit of an overview of one single country where you can see that the open access is rising. The gold open access is going in Ethiopia even to, to 80%. But obviously there is a bit of um, a decline in the repository open access, the green open access. And there is some hybrid open access. The message is that there is quite a lot of publications in open access. So the willingness to publish in open access is there. Only the attitude of where you have to publish should change so that you publish in African journals and not in all those uh, prestigious journals. So we need to change. We need to go to more local open access journals, I mean, in all the parts of the world, also in Africa. We need to have a quality check of those journals by including them in indexing services. And I think the DOAJ would be well positioned to take up those journals, but also Clarivate and perhaps Scopus can work on this. And you can even think of having your own yeah, indexing services for quality control, setting up a new one. The most important thing is that there should be an accreditation of those journals by the policymakers in the respective countries. And that should be worked on. We try to work on that aspect by our ambassador program and by our personal context of myself and our managing director and other people in the management with the respective government officials. There has to be more publishing of scholars in index local journals. If they are living in Kenya, why should you publish in a journal that is not in Kenya? So what, what are we doing? And I, I don't know enough about Clarivate and Scopus and Web of Science. Uh, in a sense, to say exactly what they are doing. So the scope of my talk will be more about what DOJ is doing. What we are doing is that we are acknowledged by many more organizations than 10 years ago. And we are considered by many the Global Open Access Index for quality. We have not so very difficult criteria. Anyone can really fulfill those criteria. Our website and application form are changing. They were a bit fancy and not very good, but we will change them into better design. And we also have the wording changed so that it's more easy to grasp what we mean. 
it will also be in many, many languages. And we already have, of course, application forms in many languages, but everything will be become better in that sense. We want to promote, and we are promoting, the creation and the indexation of local journals at the moment, especially in Africa. Um, we have collaborative projects with other organizations, like with uh, Shallow Redelic, America, Sion's Afrique in Africa, AJL in Africa, and JSTAGE in, in, in Japan, in order to make existing journals go to open access and be indexed in the DOJ and become visible, or even start journals in open access and help them to have that new journal started. We are lobbying very much for the political changes, and we do a lot of workshops, conferences, uh, publisher and editor training sessions. So I hope that I have given you an, a good overview of uh, where we should go and what I think the role of DOJ could be. But it's in the open if you want to have another indexing service to take over what we think that we can do and that we want to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Um, so I invite uh, questions from the participants to please put your questions in the Q&A chat. And uh, I'm going to use my moderator privilege to ask a first question of Tom. Um, so you showed um, the, the, the graphs from, from Cameron Nyland's um, research around where African researchers are publishing, but because the re though there, because you believe there are a number of journals from Africa that are not represented in DOAJ, um, we, we might question the validity of that work in a way because those journals are essentially invisible and not being included in, in any analysis. No, no I mean, Cameron Nalen, I said his work showed the amount of open access, but he didn't say anything about where it was published because his data don't include, as you rightly say, yeah. those, those articles that are published in African journals that are not in Scopus or the Web of Science. They only looked at the data of the journals indexed in these kind of indexes. Yeah, so I think we need to take that with a grain of salt in terms, of, because in a way what Cameron is doing is, is replicating what's being done by um, the assessment committees by only looking at the, the, um, the articles that are visible through these various indexing services. Yeah. And but it's all the, the important message is that, that there is a lot of open access publishing from African scientists, even if it's in Western journals, there is, an, there is a tendency, a rise in the open access content. And that is very positive because that's the first thing in attitude that has to change. Yeah. Um, Bianca uh, Kramer is saying in the chat that cameras work in, in, includes not only Scopus and Web of Science, but Microsoft acad Academic, which is much broader. But, but I imagine there's still mm -hmm. a lot of journals that are not visible through even Microsoft Academic um, yes. in, in, in many countries. So. It's something that we need to think about. Um, there's a couple questions now that have come into the Q&A and I will read the, read the first one out. How sustainable is the funding for DOAJ as it grows going forward? Is there a long-term plan? This is um, yeah, the, the, at the moment, uh, this cost funding scheme runs out, of course. Uh, so we had a sustainable funding scheme from different uh, library consortia and members that we asked for a three-year funding commitment. And at the moment, we are um, rethinking our funding scheme, but we are asking all the people that fund us, so the library consortia, the, the universities, the funders, the separate funders, all the many parties that 
give a bit of money or a bit more of money to BOHI to commit themselves for three years. And if we can, can get them to do that, which is in these times or the corona times, it's very difficult, of course, because um, yeah, there are many restrictions for in, in financing, in, uh, especially with libraries and library consortia. But we hope to be able to get enough funding for the coming three years. So our horizon is three years, what we aim at. And it, it doesn't look very bad at the moment. So we haven't, uh, uh, we, we can't say uh, that we have enough money for the next three years, but we're working on it. And it doesn't look very bad if, we, if you have to believe Lars Bjornshauger. He says that uh, it looks okay. Mm -hmm. That's that's excellent news, and I'm glad the SCOS funding was it was successful for for DOAJ. Um, there's a there's another question here. Um, well, more of a suggestion. It's from Evangelos again. Um, a suggestion for you, Tom. I totally agree about the need of publishing in non English languages. Perhaps DOAJ could create some kind of seal seal of approval for those journals publishing in different languages. Excellent idea, and we are we have been we are thinking of changing our criteria for the seal. So as you know, uh, we have this basic criteria. You you can just be listed in the DOAJ, and if you are um, fulfilling all the criteria, then you get the seal. We want to have another kind of seal. So we want to promote journals that don't charge APCs and give them a kind of seal. And we also want to take uh, this, this thing in consideration, uh, journals that are in non-English and journals that are uh, yeah, do, doing groundbreaking work in their countries. So that we don't, for at the moment, the seal really is a thing that is mostly war, war given to these big publisher journals because they can fulfill quite a few of those things that are asked from them. So we want to go back to the drawing table and have a whole new kind of seal very shortly. With these, uh, this is an excellent suggestion and it's on our list of rewarding it with a seal. Not very future projects, it's really for uh, the coming year, I can say. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Tom. And hope I hope you can stick around just in case there are some more questions in the next um, after Janica's um, presentation. Yes. Great. Great. And so our, our last speaker for today is uh, Janica Adema, and she is an assistant professor in digital media at the Center of Post Digital Cultures at Coventry University, where she's exploring the future of scholarly communications and experimental forms of knowledge production. She's also the co-PI on the community-led open publication infrastructures for monographs project, or what is called referred to as COPIM. And she's gonna take us through their journey at COPIM um, that they're undertaking around developing a community governance structure and, and some of the lessons learned. So it's a pleasure to have you today, Janica, and I turn the microphone over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for everybody here to, for this invitation. Um, so, yes, I have been working uh, on supporting COPIM, and I will shortly introduce COPIM next, too. Uh, so we started almost a year ago now, um, and community governance is one of the key elements underlying the project. So COPIM intends to set up an open community-led governance system for its infrastructures and processes, a structure that we want to develop together with the community of stakeholders that will be involved in the project more broadly. So uh, academics, publishers, librarians, researchers, and knowledge managers. Uh, so what I want to share with you today is what we are currently learning from other projects. So including Claxo and the DOIJ, Eiffel, Core, and Open Air around what good governance is and how we can ensure it is indeed com community focused and directed. And hopefully once we're a bit further along in the project, I will be able to share more about our own experience of setting up community led governance structures, which is what we will be focusing on in the next couple of years. 
So I want to start by highlighting the collaborative nature of the research that I present here today, which has been developed together with COPIN members and supporters, and draw strongly on the insights and establishment of other community-led publishing projects that we draw inspiration from. So this presentation draws on the work that I've been doing with my COPIN colleague Shelley, Sherry Barnes, Eileen Joy, and Samuel Moore. And in particular, on a series of blog posts written together with Samuel Moore, reflecting on a community governance workshop, which we hosted earlier this year. And this is mostly the kind of uh, 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 insights that were shared with us uh, by the participants of that workshop. So they were posted on COPIM's open documenta documentation site on Pop Up, uh, where we are indeed openly documenting the research that we are conducting and the progress that we are making within the project. So if of interest, what I will be talking about today is described more elaborately in the blog posts that are listed on this slide. So please have a look there. So first, a little bit more about COPIM. So COPIM is an international partnership of scholar-led open access presses, universities, libraries, and technology providers. So its aim is to realign open access book publishing away from competing commercial service providers to embrace a more horizontal and cooperative knowledge sharing approach instead, governed by the research community and open for widespread participation by scholar-led and nonprofit publishers. So in doing so, COPIM aims to address the key technological, structural and organizational hurdles. So around funding, production, dissemination, discovery, reuse and archiving, which are standing in the way of the wider adoption and impact of open access books. So COPIM wants to deliver major improvements in the infrastructures used both by open access book publishers and by those publishers making a transition to an open access books. So its innovations will enable more productive collaborations between actors, so including librarians, publishers, and researchers in the open access landscape, and will expand opportunities to develop the skills, tools, funding networks, and systems necessary to run open access publishing operations. So it wants to support and facilitate global collaborations to achieve collective stewardship of open access and remove structural and organizational barriers to open access book publishing, especially in the humanities and social sciences. So the work on COPIM is divided into seven work packages, including a project management work package. So work package two is developing and launching a modular scalable revenue generation and management platform for open access books to be made available to publishers and libraries. Work package three is working with selected publishers to assist them in migrating their economic models to open access versions while documenting this process. And work package four, which is mainly uh, the one that I will be focusing on today, is developing the governance procedures of COPIM's open publication ecosystem for monographs, which will be community governed and led. And then work package five is developing technical protocols and infrastructure to better integrate open access books into institutional library, digital learning and repository systems, including the development of TOAD, which is an open metadata system that will become part of the open dissemination system this work package is developing. Work Package 6 is producing a set of pilot cases of experimental books, which will be developed with the aid of new tools and platforms focused on experimental long form publications. And Work Package 7 is identifying the key challenges associated with archiving research monographs and is looking at archiving solutions for more complex and experimental long form publications. So we are keen to work on these projects with the wider community that we are designing them for. So please do get in touch also if you would like to know more about what we're doing. So on May the 1st of this year, we hosted a half day workshop focused on community governance, bringing together governance expert, key stakeholders in open access book publishing and representatives from allied large community led projects to collaboratively explore what the governance procedures of COPEM's open publication ecosystem for monographs should look like and to begin thinking about developing models to sustain the governance of the infrastructure as a community based open access service organization. And you can see some of the participating stakeholders that attended our workshop on the slide. So the discussions with the participants focus on two key questions. One, what does good governance mean? And two, who or what is our community? So from the discussion around the first question, what does good governance mean? A number of themes emerged. So one of them was situatedness or the situated nature of governance. In other words, how good governance provides accountability to a specific community or range of communities. So this involves map mapping that community's norms, values and practices to inform decision making powers based on the resources being managed. 
So this situatedness will also determine how to promote equity and fairness in a specific community. And is at the same time what makes it difficult to assess objectively what good governance is, as this is of course context specific. So this context specificness also brings with it certain expectations about governance, which might inhibit experimentation with different models. So the situatedness of an organization or project influences the kinds of normalized governance models in a particular field. So as part of our initial research for COPIM, we analyzed the governance models of a selection of scholarly communication organizations and projects, uh, not as elaborately as, as, as Tom has just done, but we had a, did a snapshot of, uh, of what's happening there. And most of them follow a quite formalized governance structure with, for example, assemblies, advisory boards, and bylaws, a setup which then becomes an expectation of good governance. But this formality can also create issues, especially also in the realm of small community-led scholarly communication organizations, which we at COPIM find ourselves in. So governance is here often an afterthought, uh, something that will come later as there are more pressing issues at hand, especially when they start off. Um, many of these kinds of organizations rely on forms of benevolent dictatorship, which is a term used by media theorist Nathan Snyder, or Basically, it means that a few individuals initially run an organization on their own. Now, if and when an organization grows or develops, who then gets to design the systems of governance? So there's also the issue of the imbalance of labor in more horizontal and informal organizations where governance comes down to those who have time to do the work. So in this respect, governance can be seen as a process. So Reggie Raju talked about a flexible tenancy model of governance that adapts as stakeholders change and organizations develop. Still a solid foundation from which to grow is needed. So governance needs to be part of the conversation whenever a project starts to be reassessed continuously. In this sense, governance might need dynamic models once it develops from more informal to more formalized. But more formalized structures can also pose a risk to the more informal relationships and community norms that have been developed. But then on the other hand, good governance might also imply setting up formal structures for long-term governance that allows people to step away from a project without it falling apart, where the systems that are in place allow it to continue to function smoothly. So the second question we discussed revolved around establishing who or what your community is. So community-led as a concept comes with a with a set of implied values or practices, such as inclusivity, informality, and a values-driven approach to organization, often in opposition to top-down or market-led forms of publishing. Yet community-led often remains ill-defined and as a concept or model is rarely used unfavorably. So this highlights the difficulty of defining what or who a community is in the abstract even though this might be the most important thing to establish for an organization or a project. So when do a project's individual participants become a community? One solution to this conundrum is to work with a more pluralistic understanding of communities, or even what Leslie Chan termed a community of communities, to indicate different needs. So within a project or organization, a community also tends to consist of different groups with different needs. So there are stakeholders, there are beneficiaries, and there are partners, for example. Defining a community by identifying the groups it is made up of in this way might even help us determine a community's interconnections and relationalities. It can also help make more visible the inequalities within communities, for example, around labor inputs, who puts in the work and who benefits from it. So communities also bring with them homogenization effects as they can obscure the difference within by assuming a shared and common identity. So homogenization is often a clear feature of how advocates, for example, uh, for open access in the global north talk about Latin American, when in fact there are of course huge levels of diversity between various countries and local contexts. So community definitions therefore require attendance to detail and difference so as not to homogenize such diverse contexts. Community also by definition impl implies exclusion, those that are not part of the community. How then do we take on a welcoming stance as a community? See, for example, which has already been mentioned today, the issue of the Anglophone and English language nature of many open access communities. 
who then gets to speak on behalf of everyone else. So all of this again emphasizes the importance of community building. How do we identify our stakeholders, benef beneficiaries and partners? So communities need to be nurtured in the processual way. This work is never done. It's a matter of keeping an eye on both the community that is and the one that is coming about. And this involves how we can support communities in a continuous way through interconnections with many other communities. So we must be open to the linkages and relationalities with other communities that themselves can be nurtured. So community then becomes less a standalone thing and more something that reveals the interconnectedness of our efforts. So this also very much lines up with the principle or philosophy of scaling small that informs the Copium project in which we're still developing and which plays a key role in the future of Copium's community building efforts. So scaling small is an alternative organizational principle for governing community-led publishing projects based on mutual reliance, care, and other forms of commoning. So this principle eschews standard approaches to organizational growth that tend to flatten community diversity through economies of scale and instead puts forward the idea that skill can be nurtured through intentional collaborations between community-driven projects that promote a bibliodiverse ecosystem while providing resilience through research sharing and other kinds of collaboration. So scaling small allows for the collective coordination of resources across a diverse ecology of organizations that creates a kind of meta community or a community of communities for the provision of diverse approaches to publishing. So just to quickly say what we're doing uh, next for the work that we're doing around governance in uh, Copium. So we've set up a governance working group in Humanities Commons, uh, which will work with us towards defining those kind of organizational principles that will govern us. Um, and we set up a Sotero uh, library too. So if there's anything that you think we should be reading, please be in touch or join the library so that we can add you. And if there's anything else you'd like to know, please you can find all our uh, contact details here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jenica. That was really interesting. And, and I think there are a number of organizations, you know, that are going to be struggling with adopting governance models, you know, in, in the coming weeks and, and, and months and years. So we have a lot to learn from watching you. Um, are, is it your hope that you, by the end of the project, you will have defined the governance structure for, for COPIM and that will allow you to continue on and find external funding as well from yeah. other organizations? It is an ongoing process, of course, and we're, we're trying to figure out at the moment also what needs governing and who our community is. Um, I think we have some deadlines already in a year's time, and we do need to know a little bit more about what we're going to do then. Uh, but going forward, yes, I think, and for me, it's also very important to what uh, Dominique also highlights in the beginning, to, to find this interoperability between like managed projects um, and finding a way that we can govern together, right? Because it is this kind of, uh, this community-led open source infrastructure that we're building together and, and making sure that it lines up and that we can work together for me and for the project is just really important to make sure that open access can actually work as a not-for-profit and community-led endeavor. So I, I again, um, I open the questions to all the participants and please feel free to ask questions to Dominique, Tom or Janica. Um, we've, we've only got about 10 or 12 minutes left. So I, I actually have one question to lead off the open discussion, which I, I'd be interested in all of your thoughts about this. And also if, if um, participants have some thoughts about this as well, I'd be, I'd be interested to hear them. So. Uh, my question, and, and maybe we can, um, Janica, you can respond first, and then Tom and, and Dominic, is, is there any scenario in which a commercial entity can really be governed or have proper community representation? Good question. <laughs> um, it depends, I think, because I think what Tom already outlined in his analysis, you can have this kind of community input uh, through advisory boards and, and uh, but that still doesn't 
it's still the stakeholders, uh, the for-profit uh, parties that control uh, the direction of these companies. So for me, it's it's essential that we work with public companies with public infrastructures in order for these things to be really community-led. Um, so is it possible only if and when they start to uh, become public institutions? That's basically the only way I can see that shift happening. But I think maybe what is more important is for us again to start highlighting the public infrastructure that does exist, that is already out there and see how we can start to support that. Um, and I think that's again a question of getting um, our institutions, our funders lined up to start really supporting the existing infrastructure that's already there that is actually community led and public owned. I agree so much with you, Janik. Uh, we have to look at the richness of our communities and uh, initiatives and possibilities. We have to stop looking at taking care of the transformation of the industry because they have their shareholders who require, um, we know what they require. And many of the shareholders are um, funds, how you say, are not even people. They are funds from banks. So uh, to dedicate our energy trying to change the industry, I think we better dedicate our energy to change ourselves and improve our systems. Tom, do you have anything to add? I, I agree with Janneke, of course. Um, yeah, and thinking of an entity that exists, I was thinking about newspapers. Like in Germany, you have the, the TAT, which is a, a newspaper in Berlin. And they say, we want to be there for everyone. And you can just pay us what you want. And they don't have subscriptions, you know. And they have a lot of community involvement in, in telling them what they're to talk about and what to report on. And things like that and this kind of, this is really their community and their newspaper without uh, a very much for-profit uh, system so the essential thing is you need to have a non a not-for-profit infrastructure but of course you need to make money in somehow because you have to pay your people and you have to to pay for publication it's not nothing is gratis so you have to devise means that not all the money goes to shareholders, like Janneke said. And, and that is the essential thing, I think, which is uh, mostly the case with all the big publishers that we know today. And that's why we want to really support and promote the publishing initiatives outside of Europe, like Science Afrique, or like uh, the journals that are in platforms with Shallow. And, and yeah, this is the way to go for us. Okay, there are a couple of questions now in the Q&A, which I'm going to read out. Um, Marcel Laflamme says, respectfully, not all private entities are publicly traded and have shareholders as such. I'll give the example of the small family owned publisher bargain. Thank you, Marcel. Um, an anonymous attendee says, with a few exceptions, US university administrators seem ideologically opposed to the efforts described here. How can we reckon with their mindset that favors outsourcing, for example? I mean, I think what you're alluding to is this uh, very, very strong um, trend over the last several decades related to neoliberalism and how there was this idea that um, the, the market and um, the market could solve all problems. And I think, frankly, we're coming to a reckoning in many areas of our society that that's not true. <laughs> if we look at climate change, if we look at healthcare, if we look at many things. So um, I, ho I, I hope um, that the tide is changing related to that 
attitude um, uh, that favors commercial uh, services over uh, community or public not-for-profit services. Um, but I welcome also to hear the opinions of, of, of the panelists. Well, I, I would say that I think, at least if you look at books, for example, it's just not a sustainable model if we would continue to outsource, especially if we move towards an IPC, a BPC model. Um, and studies have already shown that it's just not affordable. And I think what we're trying to show is that the systems that uh, that we are creating that already have been created are affordable and sustainable. So that's an argument that you can make uh, towards uh, librarians and institutions. And, and next to that is, is this idea of diversity, of course, which I think is so important. And we're, we're missing out on, on all this fantastic research that just uh, falls by the wayside because there isn't a place for it to be published through the established uh, channels um, or we're not seeing it because it's, it's not published in the established channels. Um, and I think there is actually, I understand the feeling that that, that a lot of institutions are, are have been moving towards outsourcing, but there are also a lot of institutions that are actually really supportive of what we're doing. Uh, and again, this is mostly, the outsourcing thing is mostly a global north phenomenon when the rest of the world has been able to um, accommodate more, uh, yeah, publicly and institutional funded models. So I think look there and look what they're doing. Um, that's, that's what I would say at least. And it, it, it is very much trying to also uh, convince people, look, it, it can be different, I think. And we need to keep on telling people that it can be different and different models do exist. There is also an example from Arizona University that uh, redirected their APC fund into supporting uh, community owned infrastructures like open libraries, humanities. Uh, and there are examples in Canada as well. I think it's University of Toronto, right, right Kathleen? No, it, in Canada, it's, it's our, re, our national consortia is, is now looking at what kind of, uh, I mean, some institutions are doing it individually, but the national consortia is getting actively involved in, in funding, um, you know, non-transactional based uh, research infrastructures. Dominic, did you have a, a comment as well? I was looking the next question. What okay. we think about Plan S, and I was so concerned that I forgot what I was going to say here. But um, uh, I agree with your comments. Uh, in Latin America, also the consortia, the national consortia, are very concerned with uh, how much outsourcing and how much funds should go to the community infrastructure of open access and how much money is going to go to APCs and uh, well, those issues. Yeah. Um, we, we did a, a study, I, I, I worked on a study here in Canada that looked at um, what percentage of the library budget is being spent on open access. So for the, all the, the large research libraries in Canada, and it was only 3% compared to about 40 or 45% um, that's going towards uh, subscription-based acquisitions. So there's, and th there's a lot of money in the system. And the, what we need to do though, is, is kind of what Yannicka says, is to convince those people who are holding those bundles of money to move some of that money over, move you know, substantial amounts of that money over towards community-based infrastructures. And I think I, I'm, I'm completely agree with you, Dominic, about starting local, you know, what, 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 what do you see in your own local environment that you think you should be supporting? Um, uh, yes. So, um, sorry, there's one, there's uh, the, the, another question here, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time. So Daniel asks, what are the views of the panel on plan S? Dominic, do you want to <laughs> start? I think you already. <laughs> Referred to it. Well, I, we have difficulties in Latin America with Plan S because Plan S uh, gives the industry the possibility to, to make the transformation from pay to read to pay to publish. 
and uh, we want to see the first year report at the end of 21 at the end of 22 where does the funders money of uh, the coalition has went and uh, i hope we are wrong i hope that part of the money will go to sustain community-led initiatives publishing and open science initiatives and that it is not an exercise to give time to the industry to accommodate to pay to publish uh, system because uh, for our governments plan s puts them in a very very hard position because we need journals for our researchers we need to pay subscriptions and now we are pushed to transformative agreements and we have to pay subscriptions plus APCs because nobody will tell me that it is minus a it's it's it will end having costing more money to countries and why does knowledge funded uh, with public funds why does uh, research outputs with public funds need to be a market, need to be a product, need to be a commodity. We don't discuss that issue. We only think if it is more high or less APCs. But the main point, does it need to be a market? It is not discussed in, in Plan S. Mm -hmm. So it, it's good for privileged institutions, it's good for privileged countries, but it's not a, a worldwide solution. So we want to see where money will go. Thank you, Dominic. Is, does anyone else want to comment on Plan S? I think the, the transformative agreements, especially, are often a buy-in, a lock-in for, you, know, you have to publish with those publishers. So it's their marketing mechanism to give more, you know, just leave them with their dominance in the publishing market. And that is a bad idea, I think. But um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure that Plan S people realize this mechanism. They should, but I see it as a danger. It, it leads to really, uh, again, less diversity, more exclusiveness, and, and also even to uh, higher prices, what you see all the time. You see that everything becomes much more expensive than it should be because of inflation or so. And that is the case for the so-called APCs for, for the uh, open access journals and for the subscription journals. Well, I, I, we're two minutes past the the end time for the for the um, the session today. I, I want to thank you, uh, Dominic, Tom, Yannicka, for uh, leading this great conversation. And I hope uh, it won't end here. Let's continue working together as a coalition, as Dominic said, um, working on new models for funding, open infrastructures and working on good governance together. So thank you much, very much again. And um, don't forget, we have uh, our second joint webinar on Friday where we will hear from our Chinese colleagues about their new policy related to um, scholarly publishing. So you're all welcome to join us at that webinar, which um, if you go to the open air or EIFO website, you'll find the time for that. And I also put a link in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you to Irina and Gwen for, for hosting this webinar. Oh, thanks, Kathleen, San Janica, Dominique, Tom, Gwen. Thanks, thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye.